Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for, we, wa we wanted to wait about five more minutes. You know, this is a sold out lecture, which we're thrilled about. And we wanted to make sure everyone was able to get a seat. And I think we're pretty much filled up. I don't know if there's any seats next to anyone, if there are. Yes, there's a seat empty here. If we want some people to come down, please fill up the space. And these chairs are actually very comfortable, thanks to the, to the Witzels who are here today. They're, they're major funders of this exhibition, but also this <laughs> auditorium. So nice to see everyone, it's very gratifying. You know, we started working on this project about four years ago, and my chief curator and I, Bruce Gunther, um, some, had some conversations with the British Museum folks, and in particular, uh, two people are here today, and Dr. Ian Jenkins, about making sure this exhibition came to Portland first, right after the Olympics. There's a lot of Olympic themes in this show, as you know, but also our love in this community of the body and athletics made a lot of sense for this, for this to be the first U.S. venue for the Body Beautiful in Ancient Greece. It's also the only West Coast venue, and we're very, very proud of that. So we're expecting people not only to come from our community, but also, I think, up and down the West Coast. And for those of you who have seen the exhibition, and I think um, several of you have already. If not, you'll see it today or throughout the next several months. You'll realize these are the most, some of the most important Greek and Roman antiquities in the world. You know, collaborating with the British Museum, which has one of the foremost collections, and then featuring the great Discobolus, which has never been shown in the United States before as part of this show, is something very, very special. So we're just pleased about that. Um, I need to thank a few people who are here today. And, you know, we rely on private support to make this institution work. And I mentioned the Witzels, who are major funders. Um, some of our highest level donors are here today. Ann and Jim Crumpacker, thank you. Travers Pollock, Joanne Lilly. Pete Mark and his family, Laura Meyer, Andre Stevens, Nanny Warren, Nancy McGraw, Pat and Trudy Ritz, and Sheeta Becker, among a host of others. And I, I direct your attention to the donor wall because we have over 60 donors and many of them are here with us today helping make this happen. I'd like to give them a round of applause. Thank you. On a slightly more somber or somewhat celebratory note, this is the first lecture uh, supported by the John E. Buchanan Endowment Fund. And for many of you knew John, he served as director of this institution between 1994 and 2005. And he's widely credited, I think by myself and all my colleagues, as well as the staff and community here, of really reinvigorating this institution, placing it on an international stage. Uh, under John's leadership, our membership tripled, our endowment grew, and our attendance set records through major international exhibitions, including an important show in 1996 at the looking at the tombs of China, as well as the great exhibition Stroganov, the Palace of Collections of a Great Noble Family in 2000. And the list is long of what John did. He left a legacy not only for me and this community, but I think for the field that will be remembered for a long time. So we could think of no better exhibition and no better lecture where we're collaborating with a major institution to launch the John E. Buchanan Memorial Lecture Series. So in memory of John, that's what this lecture is about. Um, I would now like to have the great pleasure of welcoming and introducing Dr. Ian Jenkins. And Dr. Jenkins is one of the foremost authorities and senior curator of ancient Greek and Roman art at the British Museum. He has worked at this institution for over 35 years. He has his doctoral work, which is published, is on the history of British Museum's Egyptian, Assyrian, and classical sculpture collections. He has also published widely on the collections with regard to archaeology, art history, the restoration and conservation of the British Museum collections, and most recently published a major new history on the Greek architecture and architectural sculpture in the British Museum. He's completed a number of exhibition projects, too long to list here, but I will draw your attention when you go to the British Museum in London, please note all the Greek and Roman uh, installations, permanent installations, all done under the oversight and leadership of Dr. Jenkins. In 1998, 1998 he was the Samuel H. Crest Lecturer in Ancient Art for the Archaeological Institute of America and was visiting professor at Cornell, Cornell University. He also leads the British Museum's excavations in Knidos, Turkey. And most recently, he was or awarded the Order of the British Empire from Her Majesty the Queen. Applause 
it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Ian Jenkins. Brian, I think you've taken one of my pages, have you? Um, just a moment while I discover where the beginning of the lecture has hidden itself. Oh, did I take a sheet? I think perhaps you did. <laughs> it was a test. Um, this one, maybe. Thank you. <laughs> Don't panic, it's all going to be all right. <laughs> Let's go back to the year 431 BC. And Socrates, citizen, soldier, and philosopher, has just returned to Athens from military service. He loses no time in making for the wrestling school. There he's introduced to Carmides, Athens' current pin-up boy who's pursued everywhere by a great following of admirers. No one, we're told, looked at anything else, but all stared at him as if he were a statue. Do you find him handsome? Socrates is asked. Oh, yes, came the reply. But his companion continued, if he were to take his clothes off, he would be a prosopos. So perfect is the beauty of his body. The Greek word literally means without face. That's to say, Carmody's appeal is equal to that of contemporary idealized sculpture, which, according to the aesthetic of the day, reduced human personality to a general type. This type transcended any one individual looks to project beauty itself. Such beauty is both physical and moral. Carmody's is not only kalos, but also agathos. That is to say, beautiful and good, or as we might say, fair of face and sound of heart. Carmody's is all the more admirable in Socrates' eyes when it's observed that although he is being paid so much attention, the youth's own behavior does nothing to provoke it. And he makes himself all the more irresistible by virtue of his grace, charis, charm, and sophrosyne. Sophrosyne means temperance. And in the dialogue with Socrates that follows on the nature of temperance, Carmides reveals another attractive attribute in his flawless character, showing himself to be possessed of idos, natural modesty. And all these qualities add up to the, the, the physical and moral perfection for which the Greek word was arete. Now, this set of physical and moral attributes embodied by Carmides are captured in this statue, the well-known Westmacott youth, which is so beautifully displayed upstairs. This marble copy is thought to be after a lost bronze work of around 430 BC by the Argive sculptor Polycletus. It shows a boy just past puberty who stands with his weight resting on one leg and this posture sends a curve along the central line of the torso, the linear alba, from navel to throat. He's almost certainly an athlete, athletic victor whose missing raised right arm perhaps held a wreath or some other token of his triumph. Importantly, he does not look the viewer in the face, but he casts his glance down and to one side, and this demonstrates his attachment to those qualities of modesty and temperance admired in Carmody's. By no means will the original of this statue have stood alone. The Panhellenic sanctuary of Olympia had, other, and others across the Greek world served as theaters in which the male body beautiful, stripped and honed to perfection, was put on show. If successful, an idealized statue of the victor might be added to the collection of such monuments that filled the open spaces around the temples and other shrines. By the Roman period, these works were museum pieces, greatly admired and often copied. Olympia is beautifully evoked in that model which you have so ably displayed upstairs. 
For the ruling class of men and youths in ancient Greece, the achievement of arete, excellence, was closely tied up with honor. Time. Before the age of democracy, and indeed, to a large extent, during it, the pursuit of both qualities was open to those of good family. Excellence and honor had also to be won by cultivating the right look, by conducting the right sort of love affair, by excelling at athletics in, and in public speaking, and by putting on arms to fight in defense of one city, and if necessary, dying the beautiful death, the Kalos Thanatos on the battlefield. In Socrates' day, loyalty to the city or polis was a man's first duty. Greece was not a nation as it is today, but comprised a collection of independent city-states inhabited by Greek-speaking peoples or Hellenes. These were linked by common language, by religion and moral values, but were rarely united and were frequently at war with one another. Man, declared Aristotle, is a political zoon. Now, we commonly translate political animal uh, uh, as the um, interpretation of political and so on, but we could more accurately render the, the phrase sitted person, meaning one who belongs to a city with all the social and moral responsibility that citizenship implied. In the 4th century BC, the idea of manly virtue was encapsulated in the statutype known as a kuros, literally young man. The basic form and its arithmetically calculated proportions were borrowed from Egypt. There, a common type was the kilted standing male statue with head and body arranged in frontal symmetry, arms held stiffly by the sides, and legs parted with the weight resting on the back leg. The legs were not carved free, but were connected by an uncut bridge of stone. The fully naked Greek adaptation of the Egyptian type was carved with the legs free and with the weight resting on both limbs as if the figure were walking. The Greek koros was a mannequin composed to provide the essential elements of ideal manhood. These include strong, even features, long groomed hair, broad shoulders, developed biceps and pectoral muscles, wasp waist, flat stomach, a clear division of torso and pelvis, powerful buttocks and thighs, self-satisfaction in the possession of arete was projected by the archaic smile that enlivens an otherwise formulaic expression. The kuros is just so, a formula onto which identity could be imposed by painted or carved attribute or by inscription. One such is the heart-rending couplet that identifies the kuros of Croesus in Athens carved around 530 BC. Stay and mourn at dead Croesus's tomb, whom in the first ranks raging Ares did destroy. The written message confirms the common role of the Kuros statue as a grave marker, representing symbolically the deceased who lies buried nearby. As the 6th century BC drew to its close, the Kuroi increasingly soften the hard angular forms of their older brothers and, in, and exhibit a bur burgeoning naturalism. In some late examples, it's as if the figure were trapped inside and were trying to break free. As the 6th century BC drew to its close, the Kuroi increasingly softened that, sorry. The same tendency is to be found in vase painting where the pioneers of Athenian red-figured vases experiment with new pictorial effects such as foreshortening to give their subjects ever more three-dimensional volume. These developments coincided around 510, 500 BC with the beginnings of democracy in Athens, which, limited though it was, invested a far greater number of freeborn male citizens with a share in the power of political self-determination than had previously been the case. In 490 BC, the fledgling democracy was put to its first big test when the Battle of Marathon, Athens with only one other Greek state for an ally, Plataea, defeated the vastly superior numbers of a Persian army of invasion. And then 10 years later, in 480, 479, Athens was again invaded, and this time sacked by an even more numerous Persian army led by Xerxes, the great king himself. The evacuated people of Athens played a prominent role in the alliance that saw off the Persian threat 
with decisive victories on land and at sea. Within the span of a single generation, from around 510 to 479 BC, Athens had seen enormous changes in its internal and external affairs. Experiments in art that were already evident in the late 6th century BC accelerated into the 5th. The results can be seen in sculptures wrecked in the Persian sack of the Acropolis in 480 and subsequently buried in post-invasion levelling of the sacred citadel. There they lay undisturbed for nearly two and a half thousand years until the 19th century of the modern era when archaeologists excavating the site brought them to light. Among them, the marble statue known as the Critios Boy reveals a subtle but dramatic departure from the Kuros scheme of representing the human figure. The change is simply but effectively achieved by asking the Kuros to relax one leg and to place all the weight on the other. The symmetry of frontality is broken by his standing apparently casually as a boy might stand, with one hip pushed up and with the head turned slightly to one side. In a further gesture towards realism, the archaic smile, which by the end of the 6th century had already begun to subside, is now replaced by a full-lipped pout. Sulky boy. <laughs> in art and architecture, in poetry and prose, in drama and philosophy, 5th century BC Athens led the world's first great experiment in intellectual humanism. The Critias boy seems to herald in the new, but it's important to acknowledge the role of its figure type as a vehicle for the same values as those embodied in the Kuros. Indeed, in some respects, the Critias boy and his followers are the Koroi of the 5th century BC. Certainly, excellence and honor remained values associated and with the idealized male sculpture throughout the 5th century and indeed beyond. An enduring principle of Greek natural philosophy is the idea that order in the world and the, pro uh, uh, and, uh, ma the place of mankind in it are determined by the balance of contrary and complementary forces. Bipolarity was first developed in speculation on the origin and nature of the world by the Ionian pioneers of Greek philosophy who, in the 6th century BC, flourished on the coast and offshore islands of what is now Western Turkey. Before its destruction by the Persians in 494 BC, Miletus was the leading city of the Ionian Enlightenment, which produced such star thinkers as Thales and Anaximander. In the theory of Anaximander, in particular, world process is explained as the attempt of primary opposites, such as hot and cold, wet and dry, to defeat one another, as, for example, in the cycle of the seasons. Nature itself maintains the balance necessary for the well-being of the world by ensuring that no one opposite is permitted to gain ascendance over another. The early Greek cosmologists were to have profound influence upon Greek medical theory and practice, in ancient Greece, the art of healing was what today we should call holistic medicine. The human constitution was seen as a set of opposed elements which physicians sought to adjust so as to achieve a balance both in relation to one another and to the body as a whole. Balance, rhythm, proportion, harmony and symmetry are the language of ancient Greek medicine but also of representational art. Now, this is strikingly apparent in the statue of a standing or perhaps walking youth known as the Deriferos, or spear bearer, executed in bronze around 440, 430 BC by master bronze worker Polyclitus of Argos. This ideal representation of youthful and athletic male beauty relied for its effect upon an arrangement of limbs and muscles into a biomechanical system of weight bearing and weight free, engaged and disengaged, stretched and contracted, tense and relaxed, raised and lowered pairs. Every element, it was said, of Polyclitus's composition was constructed according to a precise set of measurements calculated to represent perfection. 
the sculptor even went so far as to write a treatise called the Canon, explaining the statue, something which was more common among architects seeking to explain technical aspects of their buildings. Neither Polycletus' treatise nor the original bronze statue has survived, but something of the impression it made upon the eye can be de derived from Roman copies, mostly in marble. What you see before you now is a bronze reconstruction by the a German sculptor Georg Römer, um, based on several Roman copies and um, melded together in a new reconstruction around 1920. If you open any textbook on Greek sculpture, you will find this labelled as having been destroyed in the war. Um, I can assure you it wasn't. Uh, the building around it was destroyed, but it was plucked from the ruins, and when the building in Munich was reconstructed, it was placed once more at the top of the stairs, uh, where it now uh, impressively remains. The, the Doryphoros was the, the, not the first sculpture of its kind to be composed self-consciously around a set of opposite motifs. Polycletus may have been inspired by the work of the sculptor Myron of Athens, who around 5, 450, 440 BC cast his Discobolus or discus thrower in bronze. This image of athletic youth is often taken to be a representation of a real discus throw, frozen, as it were, in mid-action. In fact, it is a synthesis of elements artificially assembled to compose an abstract ideal of refined male beauty constructed in a series of binary opposites like those of the Doryphoros. It is in the principal viewpoint that the, um, present, the spectator is presented with a sculpture composed in one shallow plane. Its major features comprise one arm that extends behind, holding the discus while the other arm hangs free, with the empty left hand brought in front of the right knee. The torso is turned to face the viewer, while the legs and buttocks are in profile. One leg bears the weight, while the other leg is weight free. The toes of the right engaged leg arch up, while those of the other leg curl under. Both sets of toes are seemingly charged like compressed springs ready to release stored action or stored energy. Elements that are held under tension, and the Greek word is entesis, used more commonly of the swelling of columns in temples. These elements contrast with those that are relaxed, and together they comprise a set of intersecting lines that describe the arc and string of a bow drawn to the point of releasing an arrow. Bios, bios, as this, the Greek saying went, life is a bow, a deliberate play on the same word, varying only the accent on the first or second syllable in order to define the meaning. Life is a bow. The metaphor appears in the Hippocratic corpus of medical tracts, where one bone setter likens properly adjusted limbs to a drawn bow in which opposite forces are balanced one against another. To represent the human body is a basic human instinct, and in the ancient world, the Greeks were by no means alone in their endeavor to show the human form as object of beauty and bearer of meaning. Moreover, as in modern societies, so in the ancient world, the living body itself was a vehicle for displaying personal and collective values such as wealth, status, tribe, gender, conformity, and nonconformity through dress, jewelry, tattooing, piercing, and other forms of body modification. Never, though, was the self-conscious cultivation of the body in ancient art and life greater than it was among the Greeks, and nowhere is it more evident than it is in their taste for nudity. <laughs> you were expecting something more exciting. <laughs> in keeping with... Sorry. 
in keeping with other ancient civilizations, the naked female form in early Greece was a sign of religious cult connected with the quest for fertility in childbearing or in the productivity of the earth. Religion is the mother of art and with their simplified and refined rendering of human form, cycladic figurines, there's one in your exhibition, seem to represent the prehistoric beginning of the great tradition of ancient Greek marble carving. In the pictorial language of the ancient Egyptians and the ancient civilizations of the Middle East, male nudity occurs in cult and other specific contexts such as the representation of manual workers or the depiction of war and its consequences. In war, it is a sign of the submissiveness or indeed the death of the conquered. Here three cruelly impaled naked victims of Assyrian might. In Greek art though, it's a happier story. From earliest times, it is often the conquering hero himself who appears naked or with some piece of armor which combined with exposed genitals had obvious attractions for homoerotic Greeks. In representations of battle, nudity becomes a standard device for distinguishing Greek warriors from their enemies, notably Persians for whom the naked body was shameful. In fact, so prevalent is the male nudity uh, in Greek art of all periods that we can be forgiven for thinking that the standard dress for youths and men was a state of undress. <laughs> Public nudity was not the norm though, either in war or in much of day-to-day -day life, especially where both sexes were present. When women were absent, it was though natural in, for, for male athletes to go naked in the wrestling school and gymnasium. Indeed, the latter, the gymnasium, derives its very name from the Greek word gumnos, meaning stripped. Gymnasia in ancient Greece were not the enclosed and slightly smelly echoing halls lined with workout apparatus that we are familiar with today. Rather, they were open spaces, often outside the city walls, in places provided with a source of fresh water and shelter in blue shadowed groves. One curiosity in the artistic representation of male nudity is the small size of genitals, or at least once that has been said, which man here would dare deny it? This must be seen as not a literal reflection of actual manhood, but a convention indicating the absence of sexual awareness in circumstances where arousal would be inappropriate and a breach of social etiquette. The erotic charge occasioned by nakedness was reduced by understand, understating the sexual parts. Failure among athletes to abstain from sex before an event was also seen to risk expending vital energy. The small is beautiful aesthetic is endorsed in art by those exceptional instances where male genitals are unnaturally large. Or so it appears to me. <laughs> in representations, for example, of the comic theater, actors wear skimpy tunics with vast phalloi dangling down below the, the hem. And failure to control these wayward pendula is an hilarious sign of social dysfunction. The retinue of Dionysus, god of wine, lives permanently outside the norm of polis society. Do try this at home. <laughs> I considered including this in your show, but it was just too exciting. Satyrs are ever ready for sex and make no attempt at concealing their excitement. They wield their tumescent members as indiscriminate weapons in a war against reason. Menads, nymphs, and animals are plundered by their unfettered lust. And when none of these is available, they practice on each other or on themselves. The gregarious sexuality of satyrs serves the polis as an extreme example of how not to behave. There was, though, even in a polite society, an approved opportunity for openly indulging in sex, namely the symposium or drinking party. 
I love the way which, in the modern age, we've adopted the symposium as a conference for, <laughs> for academic discussion. Um, the modern use of the word uh, as scholarly gathering is so far from the original meaning as to be laughable. The Greek means drinking together and refers to a peculiarly Greek social event where men came together in private houses for wine, song, and sex. Athenian painted pottery shows men being served wine by boys and entertained for by female dancers and musicians, like this one in a kinky outfit um, <laughs> with um, turban and, and cheetah skin for all her dress. As the wine took hold, inhibitions relaxed and sexual intercourse, both hetero and homosexual, often took place with and in front of other participants. Cult and the sex industry apart, though, female nudity was never a social norm in ancient Greece. The male nude body could represent a model aristocracy and eventually democracy, but there was no such reference for the female form. This corresponds to the position of women in ancient Greek society. From surviving evidence, it's not, it's not possible to generalize the role of women for every time and every place, but for the city of Athens from the 6th to the 4th century BC, the situation is pretty clear. Excluded from property ownership, politics, law and order, the life of well-to-do women was largely spent within the home, where they were expected to run the household and produce healthy children. A common image on Athenian painted pottery of the 5th century BC is that of the mistress of a household sitting on an elegant chair, a klismos, and so posed as the static, passive recipient of an object, or here a baby, brought to her by a standing, active maid. At the mistress's feet there is often a wool basket, the kalathos, a sign of the virtuous pastime of working wool, carding, spinning and weaving to make clothes and the household textiles at large. Such public life as women did enjoy was restricted to religious festivals and family funerals in which they played an important role. In religion, women could hold public office as priestesses, sometimes shown in art with the key to the temple door. In cult, women mediate between the mortal and the divine worlds. The Ionic frieze of the Parthenon provides a nice illustration of the function of the uh, of this function. On the west, north, and south friezes, participants in the procession of the Panathenaic festival are all men, horsemen, charioteers, elders, musicians, pitcher bearers, tray bearers, and figures leading sacrificial victims. On the east frieze, though, where the procession approaches the gods. It's led by girls or women, their bodies in contrast with the idealized nudity of the men and boys elsewhere in the frieze are heavily draped in tunic and mantle. It's evident that well-to-do women took advantage of the public occasions on in which they did participate, funerals and religious festivals, to show off their finery. They wore elaborate clothing and jewelry as signifiers of social standing and sometimes to attract a husband or a lover. Uh, in fact, funerals became the, the um, louche disco bar of, of ancient Athenian life. And there's a famous a case um, against Eratosthenes recorded um, in the uh, speeches of Demosthenes, um, where uh, uh, notoriously an affair had started when uh, the lady of the house um, instructed her maid to whisper in the ear of, of a man she wished to know more. Um, who later entered the house and was caught in flagrante delecto. <laughs> Whereas men were thought to be rational and capable of self-control, haha, <laughs> <laughs> women were closer to animals, wild and needing to be tamed. The story of Peleus and Thetis dramatized this notion in myth. The sea nymph Thetis was promised in marriage to the mortal hero Peleus. When he tried to take her as a bride, she resisted by using her supernatural power to transform herself into a series of wild animals and elemental forces, water, fire, a lion, and a snake. In this terracotta relief, the transformation into a lion is represented alongside the wrestling couple. Peleus, forewarned, clung on until Thetis finally regained 
her form, for her original form and succumbed to the marriage. Something of this sense of capture was retained within the marriage ritual of ancient Athens. Scenes on painted pottery show the groom lifting the bride into a chariot to carry her from her family home or leading her by the wrist in a procession on foot. And so the virgin female body was processed from having been a daughter in the familiar home of her parents to a new life in the strange home of her husband. And this three-stage rite of passage resembles the funeral ceremony with its washing and dressing of the body for the journey between family home and house of the dead. Um, there are still um, cultures that um, practice mock bride abduction uh, the gypsies of, of Great Britain um, and um, in remote parts of Chechnya. Chechnya, the, the ceremony is, is constructed as if it were a rape. Um, and the archetypal myth is, of course, that of the rape of Persephone, out picking flowers one day when the earth yawned open and from the black gulf emerged the chariot of death himself, Hades. And you remember that she was taken off to be bride of, of the underworld, and Demeter mourned his, uh, the loss of her daughter. And those archetypal mother and daughter relationships are mythological paradigms of what was going on in Athens and, and is reflected in these vases. The comparison between marriage and death was especially pronounced in the instance of young men and women actually dying before marriage when, for example, a vessel, a lutrophoros, which is in your exhibition, was, used in the, which was normally used in the ritual bath taken by brides and grooms, but was also used as a grave marker. So women were subject to societal controls to make up for their perceived lack of self-control Correspondingly, women's problematical bodies were usually covered by clothing. One way society civilized them was by keeping them covered up. This clothing also served to protect them from undue attention. As Pericles famously declared to the widows of the dead Athenians in the funeral oration of 431 BC, relayed by Thucydides in his history of the Great Peloponnesian War, great will be your glory in not falling short of your natural character and greatest still is hers who is least talked of among men, whether for good or for bad. The minimal time they spent out of doors and the chaste covering of their bodies preserved women's pale complexions along with their reputations. On black figured pottery, added white was used for women's skin, a simple device for distinguishing female from male figures. The situation in Sparta was markedly different from that in Athens. In this unusual, highly militaristic society, outdoor life and physical fitness in girls and younger women were encouraged so that they might bear strong sons to be trained as warriors. There were even foot races for girls held at Olympia in honour of Hera, goddess of marriage, an example of one of the comparatively rare occasions where religious cult permitted the display of the female body, uh, albeit only partially exposed. Aphrodite, goddess of love, is the only goddess to be regularly shown naked in Greek art. The most famous female nude of antiquity was the Aphrodite carved in marble around 360 BC by Praxiteles, which stood in her temple at Canidus on the coast of Western Turkey. It's often known uh, only through Roman copies, and this is the version that we call the Colonna in the Vatican Museum collection. In the Amores, written in the second century AD, Lucian tells the story of his own visit to see the famous statue in the company of two friends, one of whom was homosexual. Callicratidas was especially excited by the rear view of the statue perceiving that Praxiteles had combined male and female physical characteristics to produce his version of the ideal body for the goddess. The dominant message communicated by the Canidian statue to its viewers was Aphrodite's erotic appeal, and fittingly, the two models said to have been used by Praxiteles for different aspects of the statue were the courtesans Phryne and Cratina. 
Lucian also relates the tale told to him of a young man of Canidus who fell so madly in love with the statue that he hid himself in the temple and was locked in for, the, for a night of passion. The light of dawn revealed both him and the stain his lovemaking had left upon the goddess's thigh. <laughs> Oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> I won't say anything. Shamed by the offence he committed against Aphrodite, the culprit threw himself from a cliff into the sea. A powerful goddess conceived as a beautiful woman, this nude statue was designed to inspire religious awe, even as it aroused sexual desire. And it set up a frisson between viewer and viewed between the erotic gaze and the object of that gaze. There was beauty, there was sexual desire, but there was also great danger. The Canadian statue and the numerous copies and versions it inspired exploit the play between the voyeur's natural curiosity and the supernatural power of the naked goddess surprised at her bath to take revenge on snoopers. The prurient glance directed at the demigod race of nymphs carried less risk, and in the art of myth, their violated flesh is frequently exposed to the fruit as the fruit of violent plunder. Sculptors and painters also show women as sexual prey, and in narrative scenes of attack, with disordered clothing revealing glimpses of naked flesh, sometimes their clothes have been pulled off altogether, as here. Um, I must say, um, when this show went to Spain, I was a little bit disconcerted to find the workmen standing around um, and debating the label, um, where I had somewhat um, primly described the reluctance of the naked nymph um, and her attempt to push away the attentions of the rapacious satyr, um, without too, putting too fine a point on it. Um, they claim she was actually far from being a reluctant um, victim. She was gagging for it. Um, I found that all rather offensive until um, I realised that I'd failed to mention that the head was an 18th century restoration. And um, the, in the sculptor's imagination of the 18th century, he carved a coquette um, who indeed um, appears to be more playfully um, acquiescent than she should be as... as um, the, the ancient mores dictated. Painted scenes of female bathing and dressing again draw the spectator into the role of the voyeur, exercising a forbidden gaze. The restricted repertory of occasions for female nudity inspired sculptors for, into ever greater inventiveness in the treatment of drapery, where the feminine form is rendered more erotically manifest than by nudity itself. And nowhere is the power of drapery to invest female form with sexual feeling more evident than in the sculptures of the Parthenon. In one corner of these pediment, the figure of Dionysus reclines in all his godly beauty. And he was balanced in the other corner by the reclining figures of a goddess of uncertain identity, perhaps Aphrodite. While he is naked, she and the two other remarkable figures with her are draped in diaphanous tissue. This pours like water over and around feminine forms, emphasizing swelling breast and abdomen, rounded shoulder, knee and thigh, and linking one erogenous zone with another in a transformation of cold marble into warm living flesh and flowing drapery. The power of the female body and male attitudes towards it are perhaps best summed up in the story of Pandora, as a punishment for men whose champion Prometheus had stolen the gift of, his of fire, Zeus ordered the creation of the first woman, fashioned by Athena and Hephaestus to be a beautiful goddess and endowed by other gods with many accomplishments and attractions. She was a beautiful bane, a kalon kakon, named Pandora, literally all gifts, who brought with her a jar of, of evils and diseases which she released into the world. The creation myth at once explains the origin of women and reveals a beautiful woman as the source of all the suffering of humankind. <laughs> Why do you laugh? <laughs> Pandora is fashioned out of earth like a sculpted terracotta figure brought to life. 
just as Praxiteles' statue was so subtly modelled and tinted that the Canidian could delude himself that he was a, she was a living goddess, so other myths turn statues into living flesh. In later Greek art, there is a marked tendency towards greater realism in the representation of humankind and an increase in the range of types that are shown. While in the 6th and 5th centuries BC, the polis walls bounded the social and intellectual outlook of those who lived within them, in the 4th and succeeding centuries, Greek life became increasingly cosmopolitan. The cosmic polis. By the time of his death at Babylon in 323 BC, Alexander the Great had created a world in which one could go from southern Spain in the, in, in the west to the Indus Valley in the east, speaking Greek all the way. Historians disagree about the extent to which Alexander had a vision for the unity of humanity. It is certain, though, that he created a cultural cosmopolis in which the diverse peoples of Hellenized lands came into contact and interacted with others. In such a world, there flourished a curiosity for ethnicity and for the diversity of physical and social type. And these developed uh, as a taste for art that characterizes humanity in all its variety, the familiar and the foreign, free and slave, young and old, beautiful and ugly, athletic and infirm, city sophisticate, and as here, country bumpkin. The Greek theatre had always been a forum where society examined itself. The list of stock characters in comic drama especially expanded to include human types that might be found in every township. The brainless young man with too much money and pointless good looks. I bet he drives a Ferrari. <laughs> the aged nurse, the runaway slave, the pimp, the whore, and so on. These personae, in part observed from life and partly taken from previous representations, were reproduced by craftsmen to feed a taste for art inspired by the theatre. Fascination for human character and Greater realism in its portrayal naturally focused upon the human face. The formulaic and idealized expression of statues is now just one among many in an artistic culture that included the characterful portrait. Socrates himself, after his execution in 399 BC, was honored with a statue set up by his grieving friends. To judge from the surviving copies of this image, uh, from his copies, this image did little to play down his notorious pug face and, oh dear, <laughs> help, hang on, um, let's see, I've, if I press delete will something awful happen, will you all disappear? <laughs> let's try, no, push, push all right, there we go. Um, Socrates was always a difficult subject. <laughs> His image did little to play down the notorious pug face and pot belly, balding, snub nosed, and chubby cheeked. Socrates was the noblest mind of his age and one who sacrificed his life to the right of the individual to pursue his own philosophical truth. And just as Socrates had pushed against the boundaries of the mind, so Alexander the Great expanded the physical and political horizons of the Greek-speaking peoples. Alexander understood well the power of the portrait as propaganda and feared that the artistic realism of the age in which he lived would not produce pleasing results from his own idiosyncratic looks and small stature. He therefore controlled the representation of his image during his own lifetime, restricting the artist's license to portray him. Men of power and wealth liked to set their own fame off against portraits of other famous men and the occasional woman. Whole sets of former rulers, rulers and other statesmen, generals, philosophers, poets, and dramatists were assembled to adorn the libraries of the Hellenistic kings who ruled parts of Alexander's empire after his death, including the Ptolemies in Egypt, and the Attalids of Pergamum in Western Turkey. So great was the desire for visual reminders of former fame that where a personality had lived before the age of realistic portraiture, a likeness had to be invented. Such is that of the great 
epic poet Homer, composer of the Iliad and the Odyssey. His image has all the appearance of a likeness, but is in fact an artificial synthesis of elements essential to his character type. Wild, tousled hair, furrowed brow, deep set eyes uh, with their hooded eyelids. He was, of course, blind, lined cheeks, and overall a look of grave and concentrated seriousness. Captive Greece took her wild captor captive and brought the arts to rustic latium. So quipped Horace in the uh, era of the first Roman emperor, Augustus. This often quoted saying both illustrates and obscures the relationship of Greece to Rome. It illustrates uh, the um, regard that Romans had for the Greeks. It obscures, though, by not emphasizing sufficiently the degree to which Greek art and culture flourished in Roman times and, indeed, the extent to which under Philhellene emperors such as Hadrian in the second century AD, Greece became Rome and Rome Greece. Greek works appealed to wealthy Romans, collectors just as old masters have been collected in our own time. And when original works were not available, Roman connoisseurs and collectors commissioned copies and adaptations of earlier Greek works. And so the eclecticism of later Greek so-called Hellenistic art was kept alive in the Roman period and earlier Greek styles and genres also continued to circulate. Some Romans went all the way and commissioned portraits of themselves that placed a realistic head on an idealized Greek body with consequences that seem to us absurd. <laughs> Thus a Roman matron might become an improbable Venus while a Roman general could impersonate Ares, god of war. One intriguing instance of such appropriation of Greece by Rome concerns a gravestone that uh, is the number one object in your exhibition, carved around 350 BC to represent a youthful athlete. The subject is likely to be an idealized one commemorating the deceased male who probably never looked this way um, and may never have been an athlete. Around the time of the Emperor Augustus, though, this now antique gravestone was reused to mark the passing of a certain trifone. His name is carved on the architrave above the, 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 the figure in Greek letters of the Roman period, and so as to personalize the funerary stele further, the head of the athlete was recut to give it the look of a fashionable young man of the Augustan age, complete with hairstyle resembling that of the Roman emperor himself. Again, this portrait may have borne no resemblance to the actual person it represented. This recycled artifact has come down to us in remarkably good condition. When the memory of Trifone had faded away and he was no longer remembered by his descendants, his greystone must have fallen and become buried. And so it escaped the fury of religious iconoclasm in the early Christian period when the triumph of Christ was associated with the mortification of human flesh. No pagan object that celebrated the human body was safe unless it could be reinterpreted as a Christian image. And so the cult statue of Demeter in the British Museum from Canidas on the west coast of modern Turkey was re-identified as a Madonna and preserved remarkably intact. While so many other beautiful statues, of which mere fragments survive, were broken up and tossed into kilns to be burnt as lime for mortar. Bronze statuary was even more vulnerable to being melted down and recycled at a time when such works were valued more as scrap metal than they were as art. The large-scale bronze sculpture of ancient Greece is all but lost to us. Occasionally, though, the sea gives up its dead and the chance discovery of an unexpected masterpiece that had been lost in a wreck. Such are the 5th century BC Riachi bronzes found in the sea off the toe of Italy. These naked, youthful and bearded warriors do not draw the eye gently with the sweet modesty of the Westmacott youth. Rather, they seem to threaten us with a fatal attraction, their naked machismo charged with the possibility of violence or death or both. One of the salient features of the Riachi bronzes and one shared in common with other bronze statuary is the detailing of such features as eyes, lips, teeth, and nipples in different metals. Copper, gold, and silver could be used for color contrast against the bronze, while 
glass and ivory could also be used for the eyes. As much as Greek art admired by the Romans was admired by Romans, it was one part only of the intellectual humanism that defined the Greek le legacy in art, architecture, drama, philosophy, and science, the Greek experience first shaped modern Western notions of what it is to be human. Greek sculpture is full of breathing vitality, and yet, at the same time, it reaches beyond mere imitation of nature to give form to thought in works of timeless beauty. It is this humanism on the one hand and idealism on the other that characterizes the Greek representation of the human self. Whether we seek it in the conceptualized and early simplicity of Cycladic figurines or in the characterful portraits of later times, human form in art was both physical likeness and bearer of meaning for sensitive people whose art was motivated by lust for life in the tragic certainty of death. Thank you. Yes, I'll take questions. We have until 3.30, so um, uh, if anybody has anything they want to ask me now, then please do so, and we can also convene outside in the foyer. But is there anybody who'd like to ask anything at all? Yes. Uh, oh, the head position of the Zobolus. Yes. Um, the Zobolus is of course, a Roman marble copy, 2,000 years old, of the lost bronze original. Um, and when it was found, it was missing its head. The dealer concerned no relation, Thomas Jenkins, corresponding with the prospective client, Charles Townley, insisted that the head was ancient and original and had it artfully fitted to the statue uh, looking forward. Um, this was in full knowledge that uh, a, a, another version of the statue, the Lancelotti one, had already been found with the head correctly looking back at the discus. Um, so why was it accepted? And the answer is that there was an idea current in the 18th century that the Romans were the improvers as well as the admirers of Greek art and that there had been criticisms of Myron's original statue, um, which, for example, um, point out that the torso, um, contrasting with the legs in sharp profile, is unnaturally uh, abrupt. And um, nice proof of, that, of the fact of that is the attempt by Erwin Huber, the decathlete in the um, notorious film, or oh, notorious Olympics of 1936 in Berlin, the Nazi Olympics, so-called, recorded in the film of Leni Riefenstahl. Um, he metamorphoses out of the uh, Lancelotti Discobolus. And you can see how awkward he looks and must also feel um, in trying to reconstruct the pose. Um, it's an idea that um, was current, uh, particularly in France, where Napoleon, having looted the museums of Europe and assembled a great body of sculpture in um, Paris, in the Louvre, um, his antiquary was forced to defend the sculptures as originals when a growing tide of opinion was dismissing them as Roman copies. It was, of course, convenient for the British in particular um, to downplay the significance of the Louvre, um, but there was a, a legitimate argument in, in the case of, of Visconti, the Napoleon, Napoleon's and in 1802, for example, there's a, there's a wonderful encounter between um, the British Conoscenti, who take advantage of the Treaty of Amiens, and they cross the channel, and they go to check out the Louvre. And there is Flaxman, John Flaxman, the great 
neoclassical sculptor explaining why the Apollo Belvedere is not a, a, a Greek original, but in fact a Roman copy. And in comes Visconti. And um, a conversation ensues along the lines of, oh, well, Mr. Visconti, you can join our discussion. And um, we were just explaining that your Apollo is not an original Greek, uh, but a Roman copy. And uh, Visconti, um, with a great intelligence, comes back with the phrase, ah oui, mais ces sculptures consins sont les imitations perfectionnées, perfected copies. And um, it's in that spirit that the Discobolus was um, accepted by Charles Townley. And because it became the most, the best known Discobolus, it was the one most accessible because it was visible in the British Museum. It was the one most engraved. It was eventually the one most photographed. It was the one most quoted uh, in secondary sources. Um, it has become uh, generally accepted that the head um, is looking the right way, when in fact, not only does it look lo lo the wrong way, but it belongs to a statue of uh, uh, nearly um, two generations later. Yes. You'll have to shout, I'm afraid. Will this lecture be available online or in form? Well, uh, it's, it's essentially um, the, the text of your book um, and of another book, which is the um, Greek body, um, accompanied by photographs of objects which are not in your exhibition. Um, so you can read, bro broadly speaking, the argument. Um, um, putting it online uh, would be another way of, of, of circulating it, certainly. But that's. Um, yes, it, it'll be online. Good. Okay, well, there's your answer. <laughs> yes. Yes, would you like to repeat the question to the to the hook? Um, I'm being asked about the, the, the little jug with, with um, a rooster and, and, uh, and the cockerel on. Um, you're thinking of those little uh, b black jugs with, with, with scenes of children. Yeah, um, well, they are called the Coe's um, jugs, um, and they are given to children at a festival called the Anthesteria, held in February, which was the great dramatic festival of ancient Athens, where the great plays that we revere of Aeschylus, uh, Sophocles, Euripides, and the comic playwright Aristophanes were staged in the theater of Dionysus on the south slope of the Acropolis. These little jugs held the child's first taste of wine. And they are, as it were, um, given in the spirit of a rite of passage. Infancy was hugely um, surrounded by dangers and very uh, many children did not survive into um, their second or third year. As they reached the, that age, so their um, entry into toddlerhood, as it were, um, was celebrated by their being given an adult drink, the first taste of wine. And they are um, often vehicles for the representation of um, very touching scenes of childhood which illustrate the extent to which the Athenians had a sense of childhood. Um, there are many societies um, currently beset by uh, poverty, famine, and war who can't afford childhood. Right. Yes? In considering the place of women in Greek society, yeah. what's your opinion about whether they actually went to the theatre during the This is much talked of um, subject. Um, I think I'm afraid it's probably um, I come down on the on, on on the side that excludes them from such public occasions. Um, we must though remember that the plays were repeatedly put on after um, the fifth century, in particular in South Italy, um, and it may well be that Athens is extreme in this in this respect. Athens is our greatest source of knowledge, but it may also not be um, our greatest source of generalization about life in Greece um, in other places. So 
my feeling is that at the games, certainly women were not present where the male athletes were performing, but also I, I believe at the theatre too. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lady in Green. Mm -hmm. But I can picture me and you sitting in front of your statues for hours, contemplating them. <laughs> and I'm serious. And, and so, what is that like for you as a curator? And how do you draw from your own personal community? Well, draw is a good word, actually, because when I first joined the museum, I used to sit in the lunch hour and draw the sculptures. Um, and that was one of the best ways of, of, of acquainting myself with them. Um, I'm also extremely interested in conservation history and in the um, careers of our, our great cons conservation department in the British Museum who know the, the material intimately and often have um, many insights to um, reveal. For example, it was um, because I was so interested in the surface of marble, its tooling and its weathering and its, its other histories, that um, it was me that faced the great um, scandal of the cleaning of the Algin marbles, which um, had been suppressed uh, in the 1930s and re-emerged in the 1990s, um, well, at the very end of the 1990s, um, in the writings of, of um, William St. Clair. Um, as a consequence, um, I, I reflect that the um, British Museum reception of the Algin marbles divides into dates BC and AD, before cleaning and after Devine. <laughs> Um, so, um, there are those uh, as aspects to my forensic interest, but the other interest, of course, is in the poetic and spiritual um, uh, uh, properties of, the, of these sculptures. Um, and that's, I think, the thing which I hope to have left you with um, by coming to Portland this week and sharing with you, is an understanding of these um, remarkable images as pictures of us, of pictures of humanity, um, with um, all our complexity. Mm -hmm. One more. Yes, one more. Thank you. I don't mean any disrespect to Clara Dot to say that, since you mentioned the old marble, you mm -hmm. have to do with that. I was in Greece three years ago. Mm -hmm. Was it in the Government of Justice Museum, Museum, have you been there? I have indeed, yes, yeah, several times. Right. Um, it's, uh, yes, it's, it's a fair question. You know, um, um, did you want to say anything else? Um, thank you. Um, right. Well, um, you know, what, what I say is that the sculptures can't go back, but they could go forward. And I don't know what the future may be, but um, to regard the British Museum as, as the final home of all the things in it um, will be to go against history. Um, I think that the important thing, and this really should be the last thing I say, um, about the Acropolis Museum and the British Museum is that they are fine examples of what I call the metaphor of the mirror and the window. The Acropolis Museum is a wonderful example of a mirror museum where people of Greece can look in and see themselves reflected, their history, from objects which are exclusively drawn from Greece. The British Museum is a fine example of a world museum where you look through the glass at other people's worlds, other people's civilizations, collectively gathered together in a, a, a one great um, uh, show of comparative cultures. And I believe that both should exist and that it's a source of um, joy rather than regret that there are two great museums in, in the world where the paths and sculptures can be seen uh, differently shown and differently interpreted. Um, I am a great admirer of, of, of the work that's done in, in, in Athens um, and I particularly applaud the uh, way in which the cast, the white plaster cast that the British Museum supplied in the 19th century have been incorporated into the display of the um, Parthenon sculptures in Athens so that 
in formal terms, um, in plaster cast and in marble, the story is complete in essence. Um, and what you would gain by taking the sculptures out of the British Museum and putting them into the sculpture uh, arrangement in Athens is um, a refinement of what is already there, um, but a loss of, of, of what was once uh, gloriously in the British Museum. Well, a big thank you to everyone. Thank you, Ian, for a wonderful talk. Have a great day. Thank you.